Welcome everyone. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, so Oliver Schulte. So he's a professor at the School of Computer Science uh, at Simon Fraser University. Before that, uh, he did the, his PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and then he works on a number of things. Uh, so that includes, uh, well, I guess his main research focus is machine learning, but uh, that includes also uh, machine learning for structured data, uh, sports events. In fact, uh, the main topic of his uh, uh, talk today will be about sports analytics, and he's really an expert on, on this. So he did spend, uh, I believe, two or three years with uh, Sport Logic, where he was a research director there mm -hmm. and uh, led several initiatives. Uh, he also does some work uh, regarding uh, Bayesian networks, game theory, scientific discovery. Uh, let me mention as well causal learning. Uh, so we had some great discussions uh, yesterday, and uh, he convinced me uh, in, in past uh, collaborations that uh, we need to rethink machine learning, at least from a causal perspective. Uh, so even though I don't think that's what we'll talk about today, that is a, a topic that uh, I think is, is quite exciting, and, and Oliver is one of the leaders in, in, that, in that sphere. Okay, so um, Oliver is, is really a uh, a, a great researcher who's won several awards, but perhaps his uh, main claim to fame is that uh, he actually uh, played a, a game against uh, the, the champion Kasparov for chess, and he actually had a draw. Uh, so this is quite a feat. And uh, yeah, so uh, so Oliver is, is a very smart guy. He'll tell us about uh, uh, some very interesting research today, and uh, I won't delay this any further. So. I'll let him uh, take over, but uh, please welcome Oliver. All right. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, nice introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm pleased to uh, be here. You know, we I really felt like traveling after uh, the pandemic. Uh, Pascal and I have been working together on sports and machine learning for a couple of years now, but almost all of it has been remote. So, uh, okay, so very pleased to be here, having great discussions. Um, and I'd like to tell you about uh, some of my work about implying, applying reinforcement learning to sports analytics. And two problems in particular I want to look at is uh, valuing actions and ranking players. Also like to make a plug for our sports analytics group. So there's uh, five faculty members in it from four different faculties. So it's a very interdisciplinary topic. And we run an online webinar series uh, with people speaking who work for teams, people who work for, like, say, the um, Own the Podium Canada, like associations, um, people from industry, uh, all kinds of sports, um, you know, hockey, of course, basketball, soccer, cycling, volleyball. So I think, uh, and we've been doing it for two years. So I think if you're interested in sports analytics, there'll be uh, some uh, lecture that you'll find interesting. I'll give the link at the end. Um, so yeah, uh, I think as sports analytics is a great application area for AI. Uh, many topics are relevant. Maybe everything is from AI is relevant. Um, so sequential decision making, right? You're taking one action after another and trying to achieve an objective, like scoring a goal. Multi-agent systems. You have uh, multiple decision players on a team. Um, perhaps you could add the coach in there too. Um, Game playing, uh, right? So some of the techniques from game playing, even game theory can be transferred. Um, it's, uh, we have very rich data, uh, event data in a spatial temporal context. So I'll be talking about that a fair amount. Right? so we have to deal with time series and um, stochastic processes. Uh, there's a trend now to use more and more graph learning techniques. Uh, for example, you model players as nodes and then you try to capture their interactions in the graph. Um, one thing that I've worked on is uh, representation learning. Uh, I think of this as a kind of precision sports analytics, the way you have precision medicine for individual patients. So you want to have general uh, models, but you also want to tailor them to teams and players. Um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, many things come in and it's a real world setting with rich, uh, rich data um, where you can explore these ideas. Uh, so here's my plan. I wanted to talk about uh, expected values, um, which more or less formally you can think of probabilities of success. So given where we are in the match, 
how likely is a team to uh, succeed in the near future. So I'm going to first define this concept uh, in a bit more detail and then mainly uh, show you why I think this is really a fundamental problem okay? in the sense that uh, if we can solve this, then we can solve many other problems in sports analytics. And in particular, uh, I'm going to discuss how you can go from a success probability model to defining values of actions, and then how from uh, the values of actions, you can derive player rankings. Okay, so the first part is, okay, what, what great things can we do if we have a good model of success probabilities? And then the second part is about, well, how do we actually learn success probabilities? Uh, and there, uh, we'll talk about the design space of learning success probabilities, but the main focus is on deep RL for deep reinforcement learning for continuous time and space. Okay, um, okay so the, uh, the key function that uh, I'll be uh, exploring is the expected value function. So what is it? Uh, well, so as input, you get a set of uh, observations ordered by time. Uh, it's a little blurry, but it's okay on the screen, right? Uh, you yeah. can see, yeah. So, and this represents a match history. And then the output uh, that we want to produce is uh, the expected success. So maybe the probability of scoring a goal. Um, you can have different notions of success. Uh, so, I'm, and depending on the notion of success, you get a different concept of uh, expected values. So I'm giving some examples of what uh, people have used in sports analytics. So an obvious notion of success that we're interested in is winning the match, right? And then uh, expected value gives you win probabilities. Okay, so that's what you need for betting. Um, another one could be points, uh, for example, in basketball, for every uh, basket, you get uh, a number of points. And so then the expected value uh, would be telling you, okay, how many points can I expect the team to get out of a possession? Uh, there is a, a concept that's uh, become widely used in um, sports analytics called expected goals, which says, okay, given a shot, what's the probability that the shot leads to a goal? Right, so um, another notion of success that I've uh, used a lot in um, my work is the probability of scoring the next goal. So not necessarily within the same possession, just, you know, whatever goal happens next, is it my team that's gonna manage it? Okay, so the theory uh, I'm developing is fairly general. So uh, you can sort of plug in your notion of success and then train a system to uh, estimate the success probability. Um, yeah, I give an example from football, that's okay. So this is kind of abstract, let me uh, visualize this. And uh, I'll start with a soccer um, example. I hope that's okay. I know I said I would talk about hockey, but A, I want to show how many of these ideas really transfer across sports. And B, the soccer people have the best visualizations. They just, they basically, <laughs> there's the most interest and they have the most money, so. Uh, so this is something that Luke Bourne came out with. Luke Bourne used to be at Harvard, then he was my colleague at SFU for a while, and now he's, uh, running a SPAC, so that's another whole story, but um, uh, so his group. Um, so I'll sort of talk over this. Um, actually, let me pause it so I can explain a bit what you're seeing and then I'll run it. So you're seeing video here on, oh. I you need to drag it. Drag, drag, drag. Oh. No, okay, can I point? This is video from the game. Uh, and, uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, and here is an XY redition of what you're seeing um, uh, on the on the left. So a two-dimensional redition. Uh, this is called tracking data. So you know for every player uh, where they are at a given time. Okay, and at the bottom, uh, okay, that's another thing. It's a good thing I'm checking this. Uh, sorry, you cannot see the bottom. That's the punchline of the whole thing. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, you know, I think, sorry about this. Uh, I think, let me go try to fix uh, this play. Yeah, if you, if you do mirroring, that makes it Yeah. 
Let me get to the. Yeah, I gotta get the. Uh, now we gotta get the monster again. <laughs> Clicked here. So now I'm uh, okay. Okay. Uh, ah, hallelujah. Okay, we got the bottom. Okay, so left broadcast video, right uh, tracking data. And here at the bottom, the model is estimating as the game is unfolding. Uh, the chance that the team with possession, Barcelona mainly in, the, in dark, is going to score. I mean, it's actually the difference in chances. So let me just let it run once and then I'll go over more slowly. Um, so here you can see it's a dynamic quantity. Uh, there's going to be a backward pass uh, that has just happened. So, um, so their uh, chance of scoring went up because they were more in control. Okay, so here now they're getting closer and aha, and now there's another pass uh, to Messi and that increased their chance of scoring again. Okay. Uh, so at every point, let me maybe do it one more time. Um, right, so at every point it's watching the game and it's saying, okay, now here's what I think the chances are Barcelona is going to score. And you can kind of relate this to some of the main um, main transitions that we see happening. So can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so does the model know it's messy? Uh, no. Okay. This so, one. So it did, maybe the probability might go up a bit? Aha, uh -huh. yes. And, uh, and it should. So that's, uh, I'm glad you're asking that question. That's a topic dear to my heart. This is what I call the precision, right? Um, but in... Um, can I notice there are negative values? Yeah, I think this is, they're doing the difference between... Oh chance that Barcelona and yeah um but that's uh, yeah actually I saw at the MIT Sloan conference so it's the main conference uh for most visible one for sports analytics and I saw they were presenting this paper and I asked this question I said do you are you modeling player effects so so I can say with confidence <laughs> they're not because I asked the question to the author and I got the answer um okay so here's something that we have done um uh, so we've done the same thing uh, where we, as the, this is for a hockey game between the Penguins and the Blue Jackets, and as the game unfolds, we, we are tracking in real time uh, the chance that um, the team is scoring. So we have one plot for uh, the Penguins, that's the orange one, one plot for the Blue Jackets, that's the blue one. And you can see here the Penguins are attacking uh, close to the goal, but uh, so their scoring chance are going up but they're being deflected. Um, so now it's fairly even, they get possession, attacking, and around here, the model's like, wow, that looks really promising, didn't happen, but the model's getting excited. Yes, the higher and higher and higher, it climbs and then yes, the goal. Okay, so, um, okay. Uh, so that's the idea, the, the expected probability of success, uh, and, uh, and it's a dynamic quantity that we're trying to track over time. Um, oops. Okay, and so um, I would say maybe the very first paper was this idea was uh, by the Harvard group uh, present 2013 Sloan basketball, and then we had a paper at UAI on hockey, and since in 2014, and then since then, this idea of building success models, I think it's really um, been widely accepted and different researchers have um, validated this for different sports. So I think, you know, I can say, I'm sure it works in hockey and, you know, other people have worked on this. So I'm just giving you an idea here um, that this has taken off. Um, so now suppose we have this kind of uh, dynamic success model. How can we get action values out of it? Um, so that's the next thing I wanted to discuss. And the basic idea is to uh, define the concept of the impact of an action, which is how it changes the probability of success. So I think that's natural, right? So if you take, a, like in, if you remember the soccer example, if you make a backward pass and your chance goes up, then that has a positive value. If you 
lose the ball, for example, your chance of uh, scoring will go down, you have a negative value. Um, okay, and then already in 2014, this is the Harvard guys, they said, we assert that most questions that coaches, players, and fans have um, can be phrased and answered in terms of expected future success. So that's one big takeaway. I couldn't say it better. So uh, no, that's, uh, that's, I think it's the, should be the basis of sports analytics. Um, okay, so, so what are the advantages of this? So I, I will say this abstractly, and then I'd like to kind of do a little case study um, and uh, then, you know, sort of discuss it in a concrete example. Uh, but generally speaking, um, why is this a good approach to action values? So one is we have look ahead, right? Because we're saying, uh, given where we are now, what is the chance of succeeding in the future? So this means we can capture medium term effects. Okay? So not just, okay, is the shot gonna lead to a goal, but is this pass good because it's likely to lead to an assist, which is likely to lead to a shot, which is likely to lead to a goal. Um, uh, success probabilities are context aware because the uh, remember the match context is the input to the model, right? So everything is done in terms of where we are in the match. Um, and uh, it's important uh, to distinguish a high probability of success versus an actual success. So a strong player could be creating all kinds of chances that don't materialize, maybe due to bad luck or maybe because their fellow teammates are not picking up on this. Right? Uh, that used to be kind of not obvious to sports analysts, but this, these X school models have really helped get this idea across that it doesn't just matter whether you actually score goals, that matters too, of course, but also whether you uh, create situations where there's a high chance of scoring. Uh, another advantage is that all actions are evaluated on the same scale and in the same units, which is difference in probabilities. So you don't have to ask questions like, oh, are three zone entries worth as much as a shot compared to five successful passes, right? We're measuring uh, apples to apples here. Okay, so let me see if the AV will play along. <laughs> Just kill the sound for a minute. So this is, I'm gonna go for my little case study. I'm gonna to go to a great moment in Canadian history, uh, the gold medal game of the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. Um, and uh, let's see, maybe just a little bit further. And I'm just gonna play through a sequence, comment on what's happening, and then discuss it from the point of view of action values. Okay, so this is the final Canadian attack. Crosby is crossing into the offensive zone, uh, gets in a shot, a weak shot, right? Gets the puck back to Iggy, who passes it, and yeah! Okay, the nation is ecstatic. Uh, you remember this? I remember this, so, okay. <laughs> um, so let's maybe just go back there for a second. So maybe I'll pause it here just to make it vivid. So now the question is from a player ranking action value perspective, who should get credit for what here? I don't know, I'll pause any suggestions. So if you just think about, you know, what, what should we do here? If you're, you know, if you're a coach or an analyst and you're evaluating your players, Yeah, the whole thing. So I guess going back from, so the attack uh, started, okay, maybe I'll go back. Uh, wait, where was it? Yeah. So let me just let it run so I get the right place. Uh, yeah, so when, like, there's a successful attack, right? Okay, starting here. Yeah, see, if you're a defenseman like Dave, you would say these guys get a lot of credit, right? Okay, <laughs> why would you say that? Uh, oh, okay. I don't know, I mean, the forwards are getting open and they're advancing the puck up to a, a spot where Sid can attack. Okay, okay, so they're getting the initial uh, promising situation. 
okay? And, um, and so one of the things to notice, if you just do uh, goals and assists, then that will completely be gone, right? The initial setup works. So, uh, okay, and now Sid gets the cup. How about this sequence? So is this uh, just normal or anything here? It's not a goal or assist either, right? Okay, well, we could see about that. Okay, so now, now he gets a shot. So most uh, standard sports stats will say, okay, he gets a shot, you get a credit for a shot. Um, was that shot worthy? Maybe. It almost looked like the puck might have got bumped off the sticky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so an X goal model would capture that. So it would say, okay, he gets credit for the shot, but he doesn't get much because it had a low chance of going in, right? So he would get uh, no credit for getting to the position at all, and he would get a bit of credit for the shot, right? Um, okay, so now Iggy. So Iggy would get credit for the assist, right? And then Crosby, of course, for the goal. So in the standard sort of traditional points method, it would, credit would only be at the very end. Right, there wouldn't be much for what was leading up to it, and certainly not for the defenseman in the beginning. Right, so I would say if we go uh, back here, okay. So this carry, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but uh, this carry is to me very impressive because he's got four defensemen on him, right? And many players would at this point uh, dump in the puck like sort of send it behind the net and think, okay, hopefully someone will pick it up, right? And this is, I mean, you kind of have to be Sidney Crosby to do this, right? Be like, ah, four guys, what the hell? I can score. He's trying to score, right, with four guys on it. So um, I, could, I know not everyone's a Sidney Crosby fan, but I'm, so I'm everybody impressed. Everybody is. Hmm? No, really, really everybody is. Okay, good, good, good. So <laughs> um, great, good to hear. So, um, so I would... Uh, and uh, I would argue that actually this carrying the puck like this should get a lot of credit, right? Even though it didn't, uh, well, maybe it led to a shot, but it certainly was not an assist. Um, okay, so, uh, with ex so with success probabilities, uh, we would get this, right? So we would say in our model, okay, this is creating a very dangerous situation. Uh, and so he's raising the chance of scoring, right? Not immediately. And even with the defenseman, right, that successful pass uh, to set up Crosby was really raising the chance of scoring in the attack. Right. Um, okay, so we can build a model where, as I was showing you, right, where we estimate the chances at every point. And I just want to give an idea of what that looks like. Um, so here in the box plot, we take various types of actions. And then uh, every point here is uh, the impact of one, one specific instance of this action performed in a specific match context. And then you see, uh, for example, for shots, the median is the highest impact, and that makes sense, right? That has shots have the highest chance of leading to a goal. Um, takeaways are actually quite important. So that's something that this is telling you. Um, so actually, yeah, many uh, goals that follow after takeaways. If you look at the face-offs, for example, offensive zone face-offs uh, are more important than neutral zone face-offs, so that makes sense. Uh, but uh, so kind of penalties have the highest negative, drawing penalties has the highest negative impact, so that all makes sense. Uh, the main thing I want to highlight here is that there is, however, a wide range, right? For the same action, the impact can be quite different depending on the context. So this is a very context-aware model. Um, okay. uh, so how can we get now, now we know how to evaluate actions, how can we get to player rankings? Uh, and so we basically, you know, just rank all the players every season and then I look at what comes out, it's a lot of fun. Um, in 2013-14, um, uh, we had actually Jason Spezza come out on top. And so this is interesting in a number of ways. So first of all, if you look at points, right, the traditional assist goal metric. So he has many points, but by far the highest. Sidney Crosby is the king of points. Um, 
So that's telling you that we really are looking at uh, values assigned to these more intermediate actions, right? Like passes, maybe even face-offs one. Um, the other thing uh, that's interesting to note is his plus minus is atrocious. Yes, at first I thought, okay, that negative sign uh, must be a typo. Okay, so plus minus, uh, let me just explain, is this traditional metric um, widely used and widely uh, uh, what disdained, but it says uh, if you're on the ice when your team scores, you get plus one. If you're on the ice when your team is scored on, you get minus one. So what the minus 26 is telling you here is that basically Spezza was on a, on a poor team, okay, which is the Senators. I'm not saying the Senators are a poor team always, but just in that season. Okay. Uh, and um, so that's why uh, he has a high, uh, he comes out high on our metric, but his plus minus is low because he's on a poor team. So it shows you that the metric can, to some extent, tease apart the overall performance of the team from the individual player's contribution, right? So he's doing a lot of things that are the type of action that lead to high scoring chances. Um, but then his teammates aren't taking advantage of it. Um, so I'm pleased with that because that's actually one of the things that's difficult in sports analytics, right? Because all the uh, players are playing together and how can you tease apart, right? Their collective contribution from the individual ones. And so this is uh, metric is doing this to some extent. Um, then in hindsight, actually, I feel like we got a bit of confirmation. So our assessment was that he's a great player on a poor team. And he did request a transfer, which was granted. So I was kind of pleased because, you know, we got this result before that. I was like, ah, that's what I would have advised him to do. And he did it. So, um, so we did another ranking, 2015-16. Uh, so here I'd like to just highlight uh, how you can identify undervalued players. Uh, Goudreau and Scheifele here have relatively low salary. Um, compared to say Chris Crosby. Uh, and, um, and again, in hindsight then, uh, this assessment was kind of validated because they, the contract went way up in the next season. Okay. Now in the NHL salary is very complicated because there's a lot of rules around it. And I mean, you can't really just say, okay, low salary means uh, their team doesn't think he's, he's strong and so forth, but you know, there's, there is a connection and it seems to be going in the direction of our model. Uh, another thing about salary uh, that I want to mention, I think is interesting. So if you look at the undervalued players, they're here bottom right. So GIM is our goal impact metric. So that's our ranking. So if you're over here on the bottom right, that means you're being ranked highly. And, uh, and but your salary is fairly low. Okay. And, um, one thing we found is if we look at the player, our ranking from 2015, 16, and we compare salaries in two successive seasons, so 16, 17, 17, 18, then two years later, the number of undervalued players goes down. Okay, so that means um, the, the guys who did great in 15, 16, uh, if you go two years down the road, they are getting recognized and getting high salaries. And so uh, arguably this, what our man ranking is doing is giving you an early sign. It's sort of catching on to who's great before that's being reflected in the salaries. So yeah? Gonna, like it looks like there's actually different numbers of players. Is it just there's more overlap or is it, are there actually different numbers of players in those two drafts? Uh, okay, I should check. I think there's different numbers, uh, partly because not everyone was, not everyone who played in 1516 was still in the NHL two years later. So I should check though. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, uh, last thing I wanted to show uh, that you can do with this ranking, uh, because it's really just a sum of uh, individual measurements, you can drill down into uh, different ways to slice it. Uh, it's like OLAP, if you know about OLAP. And so you can ask, uh, for example, for a player, okay, where, like, um, who's uh, very high overall, so Carlson was high in the season that we, um, 15, 16 season, uh, you know, what type of action is it, where is he getting really high impact? 
Okay, and then we can say, oh, it's uh, when he's receiving the puck. And then we can drill down further and say, well, in what context, right? Where is he receiving the puck that he gets high impact? And aha, now it's also in sync. And then basically that's up here. Uh, so I know it's a bit hard to read, but uh, so if you look at his uh, reception, he manages to get the puck in this region 37.5% of the time. And the average player manages only 14.6% of the time, right? And our model says this is a high impact region to get the puck, which makes sense because it's fairly close to the goal. So you're, you're swapping for when they swap ends? Like which end is he playing out of? Oh yeah, it's always moving from left to right. <laughs> we always uh, adjust. Um, and uh, and it also shows you that he, he is a defenseman, but he's really, it also shows you how offensively oriented he is. I mean, which is known, but so it's showing up in our analysis, yeah? What's the motivation behind having uh, like the region at the top of the offensive zone also associated with the initial assignment? Like, because his receptions, he's probably getting a pass playing left D yeah. in the offensive zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also takes into account him getting passes at yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, I will get to this when I talk about the methodology. But here we discretize the rink, and we use like an automatic algorithm. Um, actually, I can say what it is now, and then I just won't <laughs> go into it later. So we basically we take all the reception events and take the x y locations, and then we do a spatial clustering. Uh, so the each cluster each region the regions are specific to an action okay so if an action happens uh, more often in a certain region we will get a higher resolution but i see now and so this is kind of what came out of our clustering algorithm but i see you could question that yeah you could say that's actually not really an ideal region and maybe it should be split so that's that's great i never <laughs> never noticed that so um there's a whole kind of subfield of sports analytics about how to discretize space and time in, for a sport. And, you know, people have general techniques, people have different techniques. Um, I was kind of proud of this idea, but now you've uh, poked a <laughs> hole in it. But uh, uh, Luke Bourne, who I mentioned earlier, has a very nice way, I think, to do, to learn uh, region clusters using non-negative matrix factorizations. So, so I can go into that. Um, Finally, the models that I'm going to show you are, will be the deep models and they don't do any clustering. So this, uh, if, if, to the extent that this is a problem, it goes away. Um, yeah, but maybe we should make sure that we only cluster within each zone, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, that makes thinking, yeah. Okay, so I hope you've uh, given you a sense of, right, what you can do with X values. Now I'd like to talk a bit about uh, how we can learn them. Um, Okay, I'll speed up. I know we had some hiccups here, uh, but uh, so I want to talk. There's quite a few ways to um, approach this. It's a rich problem, and um, and a number of these have been explored in the literature. So one question is, what is going to be your model class? You could use neural networks. You could use uh, probabilistic classifiers um, and uh, kernel methods as well. There's some interesting work on spatial temporal kernels, um, right, where you're trying to measure, if you're looking at two event sequences in sports, you're trying to measure how similar they are. Um, and some of these are even like customized for sports, um, the kernels. So I can go into more detail on that. Uh, you have to think about uh, what kind of inputs you use. Do you, do you use the time, do you use the space, do you use it as a continuous variable, uh, do you use the player IDs? So this goes back to Tim's question about the messy, right? Do you look at which player is playing or not? Do you look at which team is playing or not? Um, and uh, you can choose whether you want to model the team dynamic, the play dynamics in terms of some, a dynamic model, transition model, um, or whether you want to directly learn the X value function, uh, what's called a model free way. So without learning uh, model of the dynamics. Um, Okay, so, uh, so my own approach has been to use reinforcement learning. Um, and so, the, you know, the one picture I'd like you to take away, well, all of them, but if you're going to remember one, it's this Venn diagram. So I think that sports analytics is an application area of reinforcement learning. 
you know, one of the probably most interesting, one of the most challenging ones. Um, but reinforcement learning, I think, has uh, the resources to, to handle the problems of sports analytics. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that learning success probabilities is actually one of the fundamental problems that are studied in reinforcement learning. So they've been trying to, to build models of success probabilities since the 50s. Um, okay, so I have made a little dictionary to show this translation. And uh, also for, um, for those of you know, who, who know RL, this will sort of quickly convey the idea. Um, so in RL, uh, often we talk about discrete episodes at the end of which points are awarded. So in sports, we would have periods or half times, innings. Uh, as a concept of a reward, which in sports will correspond to a goal or a point, uh, for example, basketball. Uh, as a concept of a return, which corresponds to the total number of points. Right? Uh, the value function is what I've been calling the expected value function. Uh, action impact, right? The difference that you make to success probabilities corresponds to action advantage, at least in spirit. Uh, learning an X value function is what RL people call the prediction problem, right? Because you're trying to predict whether a team or an agent will succeed. Um, uh, RL, uh, the main goal is typically control to build an agent that actually acts. So we don't have that in sports, right? Because we can't control the players. I kind of wish I could, that would be really interesting. But not even their coach can control them. So certainly not me as a researcher. Um, so that's one of the first things I usually say to RL researchers. I know you guys really care about building the agents, but we're not doing that. We're just trying to understand their behavior. Um, yeah, and then I mentioned model free learning. Um, let's see. So, uh, okay, in, in um, our reinforcement learning, we use uh, Markov processes, and there is a very general model called the Markov game model. Um, so I wanted to show how you can, how natural it is to model sports in that. So, so I think I'll go through that, but maybe a bit more quickly and uh, it won't, um, it's, it's okay not to follow all the details. But um, so Markov game model, you can think of it as a transition graph um, where you have states, actions, transition probabilities and rewards. And what's different from Markov decision processes that you may be familiar with is that you're going to have a tuple of actions, one for each agent. Uh, so in sports, we take the agents to be teams, which is a bit confusing, not players, but teams. Um, and uh, the states, uh, first of all, defined by context features. So like the current score, current man manpower situation, is someone uh, shorthanded or in a power play? What period are we in? How much time remaining? Where is the game happening? Uh, these are actually things, if you remember the CBC video, that they often display on the screen, right? So because these are important parts of the context, they, they show it to you as the viewer, and uh, we, put, uh, we put that in our state. Uh, we have uh, in our data set 13 action types, um, and you can get event data, play trajectories. Um, you can... Um, uh, download from the NHL, I guess that's where it's going. So it's publicly available data, it looks like this. Uh, so here you can see how it says play by play. Um, and then it would say something like, okay, Colorado won a face-off. Here are the two players that were involved in the face-off. Here's the location of the face-off and that's the game time. And also what period are you in? Okay, so you can get that. Uh, we have actually posted uh, on my website, I've got a pre-crawl version. Okay, it's not up to date, but if you just want to start experimenting and without dealing with web scrapers and everything, you can get, uh, you can get the event data. Um, a lot of our experiments, we use a proprietary data set from Sportlogique that um, Pascal mentioned, I've been working for them. Uh, there's generally less work on tracking data just because it's wide, more, less widely available, um, while also because it's more complex. Um, but uh, we have some, okay, I'll skip this little animation. 
but it is possible. Okay, so if you uh, want to think about the kind of data we have in a tabular sense, right? So we have these different events, and each event is basically characterized by a set of features, and then we have a sequence. Um, so, uh, like for the uh, models I've been showing you, just to give you a sense of what the data set looks like, we have 30 teams, over 2,000 players, over 1,000 games, over 3 million events. So that's really, I think, even by the stands of machine learning, that's a big data set with many things going on. And so, you know, what I've been trying to do over the years is to get as much information as I can out of this rich data. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about uh, use. Yeah. Yeah, so the data that I use, it's already annotated. Yeah, so the NHL, see how it says face off, hit face off. So that's, yeah, that's publicly available. Also, my. actually an API where you get JSON files that have, they visualize it nice here, but they're just JSON files and you can see all the events in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the way you get the we put an SQL format if you, it makes it easy to write for that. Of course, yeah, okay. Anyway, I can speak more to that. So, but yeah. Um, and so, yeah, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm a little bit behind. So it's interesting questions, but uh, maybe we can go into the data in more detail later. Um, yeah, so uh, different RL methods. So one question is, are you willing to discretize, uh, especially the space? So we just started discussing that, right? Or not. Um, if you are, you can use a, you can use uh, dynamic programming. You can estimate transition probabilities um, and use dynamic programming. I do a little demo on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so you saw an example earlier when I gave the Ericsson of the discretization. Um, uh, Timothy Chan, who's a CRC at the University of Toronto, and Marty Puderman, who is one of the grand old, well, retired, retired, retired uh, um, reinforcement learning experts in um, Canada. Like many, uh, before Sutton's book, basically, we all learned our, re our Markov decision process theory from Puderman's book. And I didn't know this. I gave a talk at UBC, and he was there, and he loves sports, and he's been applying this He's been building RL models to help the UBC golf team. And uh, him and uh, Tim Chan are into the NFL and doing some real work, nice work. Now that's kind of naturally discrete because you have the yard lines, you know, so. Anyway, so I just want to point to that. Um, if you don't want to discretize, then uh, you need something that can handle the raw data. Um, you can use a classifier uh, together with a sliding window approach. Um, so this is the uh, group at Leuven in Belgium has been uh, building models like this, especially for soccer, and quite successful. They won best paper award at KDD in 2019. Um, and you could also just use an RNN, which they haven't done. Um, so, uh, but if you want to use uh, RL algorithms, especially temporal difference learning, then um, that's what we've been doing. Um, and, uh, uh, you, and our more recent models are of that type. So I will give a few more details on that. Um, so you have different options. Um, I can say, I'll say a bit more about pros and cons of each. Um, but I'd like to explain temporal difference learning because outside of RL, it's not, it's a totally standard method inside RL, but outside of RL, it's not very well known. And it's a really, neat uh, kind of surprising idea. So I'd like to sort of spread the word on it. Um, okay, so we can think, well, what are we trying to do? Well, really we're trying to learn a function here from the history to the expected value. Um, we need some kind of system that can take uh, sequences as inputs and recurrent neural networks do that. So that's fine. Um, and uh, the question is, so how can we train the neural network? And in particular, what is the, uh, what is the objective function that we want to use? Okay, so this is a question considered in RL, especially by Rich Sutton. And there's two main uh, uh, possibilities. So one is, I'll say that abstractly, and then I'll give a work through a toy example. So one is your target can be the final outcome. 
right? So you know who scored eventually, and you say, that's what I'm trying to predict. Um, in RL, they call that Monte Carlo learning. Um, and this is really uh, very natural for people who know uh, machine learning, but maybe not reinforcement learning. And sports analysts will typically uh, just come up with that naturally. So for example, we had a analyst speak to us in our seminar from the uh, Canadian volleyball team, right? And he says, okay, I want to know, should we be serving with a right? Should we be serving with a left in volleyball? And then what I do is I take all the rallies and I write down when we serve with the right, you know, who won it. And 70% of the time that we serve with the right, we won. Then I look at the left, uh, I serve with the left, and then 50% of the time we serve with the left, we won, and then so we should be serving with the right. Okay, so that's doing this final target. Right? You're saying, given the action that I'm doing now, do I succeed in the end? Um, another one, we had uh, someone who was consulting for the Raptors, and uh, he said, you know, when I tried to explain this, it was the same thing. So, like, oh, if I want to know whether I should be dribbling down the left or dribbling down the right, I just say, okay, out of all the times that are dribbling on the left, how many points that we score? Okay, so this is very natural. And if you do that, you can uh, use classifiers. So that's also nice. So um, this is the Leuven people do that. So once you're in that framework, you can basically just do a classification, right? Is this a successful sequence or not? Uh, the big downside um, and why RL people are satisfied with this is that you completely ignore temporal uh, dependencies this way. Okay, I will show that in my toy example. The other target is where you say, actually, my uh, predictions should be consistent with each other across time. Okay? So if right now I think that my chance of scoring is 60%, then at the next time instance, it should be close to 60%, maybe 65%, shouldn't just jump, okay? Um, then the standard method. Okay, so let me work through a toy example just to show this. So let's suppose we have our uh, sequence data, you know, I sort of made a low dimensional excerpt and uh, eventually this team that we're interested in is scoring. They're going from one zero to two zero. And my model is uh, estimating, okay, at this point, my model says, okay, they had a 55% chance of scoring. Here, my model says uh, 62%, here's 75%. Okay. And now I want to define my loss function. So with uh, Monte Carlo learning, I say, well, I know the final outcome was that they scored, right? Not the other team or no, no, no score. So at every point, what I should have predicted is one. Right, that was the final outcome. I said 55%, so I can say, well, the right answer would have been 100%, so I can take a squared error. Okay, I could also do entropy or, yeah. but the point is I'm comparing with, right, my, my prediction now with what actually happened in the end. And TD error says, oh, actually look at this. I went from 55% to 62, uh, 62%. And so that's actually, th those should have been the same if I had been right all along. And so I, um, I penalize my system for doing that. And then at the next point I say, oh, here I said 62%. Then I got more information. I said 75%. So now I'm penalizing my system for this. Right. So it's a lot of work in RL on which is better and why and theory and everything, but I just, I'm just happy to explain the difference. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not doing that here. I usually don't do that in sports. Um, and I mean, the, the problem is if you think of goals, they're worth the same, right? No matter when you're, when they're scored. So it's not like getting a goal now in the first 10 minutes is worth more than getting it in the last. Okay. So when you, so when you look at some of these actions, uh, it depends on like, don't you have to say that like, an action that just led to the goal? Uh, is worth more than an action that was done like, you know, 20 times steps back. Mm, well, the system kind of learns that, right? Because the connection between, so, so the impact of the action 20 times back will be much less than the one that's close. Okay, so it's not like just one reward in all of these uh, environments, like just one reward that you either win or lose, or do you have any 
uh, robots in the building. You know, like this is like a very sparse work setting, but you have like any robots in the end system. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, you can have different notions. Uh, you could just do win or lose. Uh, what I usually do is, are you goal-based? Are you getting the next goal? So it's very sparse, yes, okay. right? So if you have five goals in a game, you get five reward measurements. Okay. And that's part of what makes this difficult. So I will, yeah. I will come back to that. Yeah, um, actually, I was asking this question because, you know, you see, like, when you look at the estimated next goal chances, yeah. I'm assuming you're going, like, from one state to the other state. So, uh, so the, the estimates must be adjusted by the one that you get the next state, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the learning kind of does that, right? So okay. learning sort of back up. But this is actually, let me say, fundamentally, if you categorize sports according to how difficult they are to model, then uh, hockey and soccer are uh, up there because they're continuous flow and because uh, of the sparsity of the goals. Now, soccer is even worse. Because often you just get one goal per game, right? None, and then that's really tough. So, but say like I've also built a model for volleyball. In comparison, that's easy. <laughs> you know, you get these short rallies. You know, you get like what uh, twenty rallies in a set or so. So that means you get twenty reward signals, right? That's uh, in comparison. And I always say, uh, in retrospect, I wish I'd done tennis first. You know, every rally, one player, <laughs> nice turn taking, you know, none of this <laughs> players all acting at the same time. So, um, okay, evaluation. Um, okay, maybe I'll summarize, but uh, since we discussed this discrete business, uh, yeah, I think the visualization here is nice. Uh, so, as I mentioned, when you have a discrete system, uh, you can um, do uh, dynamic programming, um, and that will be one of our comparison methods. So I'm just going to show a soccer um, evaluation. Uh, so some, somehow this guy has managed to make uh, dynamic programming popular in soccer under the heading of expected threat. So if you're looking for the Bellman equation in sports analytics, this x threat thing is usually... Uh, uh, what you want to look for. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen anyone publish it in um, hockey, but um, I mean, I know there's some internal work. Uh, so he, here he's showing you the transition probabilities um, and he gives you, uh, this is like the Bellman equation, um, but I was just gonna, I mean, so it's fun to read. I think it would be a great teaching tool uh, or if you want to understand it, but I'm gonna go straight to the visualization here. So what we're doing is he's discretized the region around the goal into these squares, okay? Uh, not data-driven, I think it's just uh, by hand. And, um, and he's asking now, suppose my look ahead is zero, what's my chance of scoring a goal from a given region? Well, if I'm not doing anything, then I have zero chance. So you can see it's just a flat zero surface. So now let's say we go look ahead one, yeah. So now if I'm here and I ask, if I take one more action, what's my chance of scoring? Well, basically my action has to be a shot, right? So if I take uh, my chance of scoring here, uh, what's the chance that I get a goal from here? What's my chance of getting a goal? Uh, and then around here, uh, again, what if I take shots from here? And it sort of makes sense, right? The closer you are to the goal, the more likely you are to get a shot. Uh, there are discontinuities though, right? Notice that the probability is uniform across any one of these regions, even though, you know, if you just cross the border, you know, by one centimeter, it wouldn't change your chances. Uh, so that's the downside to discretizing. So now you can say, okay, what if I iterate, if, I, if my look ahead is two actions, right? So now you can see, I start to get non-zero probabilities further away from the goal, because now maybe I, you know, dribble with the goal, with the ball to get here and then take a shot, right? Or maybe pass to someone and then take a shot. So the further the look ahead, the longer the action sequences you can capture. So we can do three. And then, I mean, this, uh, in this iteration, he goes to five. Right, and then you can get like even here you get some non-zero scoring chances uh, here, so you get like non non-trivial distributions. 
Um, so this is a lot like the sort of grid worlds that we use to illustrate reinforcement learning and dynamic programming, but it's sort of done right with the soccer data on the pitch. Uh, in our hockey model, by the way, we found that 13, look ahead 13 is sufficient for the NHL. So that means that if you're asking yourself, okay, what's my chance of scoring from now, uh, you know, looking beyond 13 actions doesn't really uh, increase your probabilities. So kind of, so yeah. Like yeah, these are, well, they're meant to be, so since the values here are zero or one, right? Expected value just is a probability. So they're just meant to be the value function. Okay. Uh, well, uh, no, in this case, the Bellman equation would give that to you, yeah. Okay. yeah. Because uh, the robots are just one or Right, and no discounting, as you mentioned earlier, right? So, um, yeah, this is actually, okay, I know I'm maybe talking about too many methods, but you know, it's not our main method, right? We do the temporal difference, but I, I like the visualization. I think it's a really nice way to teach dynamic programming. Uh, here's another way to look at the differences in uh, discretization. So here for the neural network, now we do a spatial projection. So we do a heat map and say, okay, suppose you've taken a shot. Now, what are the chances that you're gonna score the next goal? Which is similar to saying, what's the chance of um, right, getting, uh, the shot being successful. So this is like a continuous counterpart to the demo I just showed you for soccer, right? And you can see you get this kind of rhomboid shape, uh, really, really beautifully smooth, right? And it tells you, well, the closer you are, the better your chance, the angles matter too. Makes sense, right? What the neural net is doing here. If you're really far away from the goal, you're in this cold blue zone, plays always moving from left to right. Uh, Early on when we did the discretized version, so then here we are near to the goal. So you can see you get this discontinuities and you get this uniformity, you know, that's kind of composed by the fact that you're not distinguishing, um, you know, that you don't only have so much spatial resolution. It's still generally right, but you lose information. So that's kind of why I switched to the continuous uh, because I don't like the discontinuities. Um, yeah, also, okay, so for the interest of time, let me just say this briefly, uh, you know, okay, beyond that, how, what can I say about why I think it's better to use the continuous deep RL model? We don't have ground truth for player rankings, so that's a bit difficult, but what we did is we said, oh, let's take standard metrics like you can find on NHL.com, like points, face-off ones, and our reasoning is, well, the reason why they're recording this is because those are important for players, right? And so what we want is we want like a reasonably high correlation with this metrics that people care about. Um, and, uh, and then you can see our method GIM uh, usually for most of these gives you the highest correlation, uh, especially points. Um, and in general, the expected uh, X value metrics have much better correlations than uh, these are uh, replacement player metrics. Okay, let's say tr more traditional sports analytics metrics. Um, I can explain them later. SI is the discrete version, dynamic programming. And, you know, it does well, but um, still not uh, generally as well. Okay, so that's sort of the takeaway. Um, oh, and also the fact, by the way, that it correlates highly with points. To me, that means that this should be doing well in fantasy play, if anyone's into fantasy play here. And that's one of my projects on the to-do list to really validate this. Um, and that's also for a couple of other reasons, so I'm, which I'll go into now. Um, so we also look at, uh, if you don't just look at correlations for the complete season metrics, you can ask, well, let's say I'm halfway through the season, let's say here, what is my correlation between say the GIM metrics, so the one I've been explaining with points and you can see like from the red curve here, we're already, you know, like at 0 0.85, right? So with final points in the season. So that means by computing this metric, I can predict a player's final points fairly well. Um, the autocorrelation is interesting too. So it says, again, if, uh, I'm halfway through the season. I got 90% correlation between what the player looks like halfway through and what they will look like at the end. 
So this really, so, okay, so this is a sanity test because you're trying to capture something stable, like a player's skills and strengths, right? So you should be able to say, okay, I've got enough data to estimate how good this guy is and then have that hold up in the future. So you can predict the uh, future from the future performance from past performance, which is what you want in a performance metric. Uh, also, I'm not showing this, but we've also compared across seasons and it's also quite consistent across seasons. So for each player, their successive uh, metrics correlate well. And so that's why I say it should work for fantasy play. So, yeah. Uh, have you compared how it is able to predict future performance with how just beyond the correlation between points and itself in the future performance? I know that's a point in a lot of sports analytics, but they they say over a smaller sample size, the traditional stats are points that are more prone to variance. Mm -hmm. Don't do as good of a job of predicting future performance as some more powerful metrics. Have you looked at the, the, the comparison between those two? Sorry, which two? Should, so yeah. could points predict oh. points in the first 50% of the season predict yeah. points in the second 50% of the season better yeah. or worse than the metric picture? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's on my to-do list. I, I'd love to say, uh, you know, that our metric predicts points better than points does. So I, I had a psychology professor as uh, as undergrad, and he used to say the best per, uh, per, the best predictor of future performance is past performance. And I'd like to say, well, except for my predictor, which is even better than past performance. So I think it would be great results. Yeah. So we should just um, see so many interesting things to do with these X value functions once you have them. Okay. So, uh, all right. All right. Um, I'd just like to mention a few other things we've done without going into details. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm really keen on this idea of precision analytics, where you look at um, the different strengths and players. We have over 2,000 players, as I mentioned, but we came up with a way of, um, of computing player embeddings. To, uh, so this is a latent feature vector that we associate with each player. You can use it to cluster players. And, um, and it predicts, uh, so it answers exactly this question, you know, if Sidney Crosby has the puck, uh, how does that affect the chance of scoring in the future? And we came up with a new way to do, to generate these embeddings. So that's in a 2020 NeurIPS paper. Um, that's, and I'm quite proud of that work. Um, uh, there's another uh, approach to um, trying to figure out uh, differences between teams where you can say, okay, well, there's the behavior, but there's also their strategies. You know, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to get into the offensive zone as quickly as they can? Are they trying to attack on the left? Are they trying to achieve certain formations? And there's a uh, part of reinforcement called inverse reinforcement learning, which um, tries to do the following. It says, oh, I'm watching these agents and I'm trying to infer what it is they're trying to optimize, right? Rather than saying, oh, I'm given their reward function. I want to find a policy. It says, okay, I want to figure out what they're after. So we did a paper on this, uh, Yudong, with Yudong, who's here. Uh, so that was in HKI 2020. Um, and there was a follow-up paper by, so we did it in hockey, by the Leuven guys on soccer. I think that's still quite an open area. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's a hard problem, but we get really interesting results. And also, to some extent, it addresses the goal sparsity, right? Because now you've got these inferred rewards, okay? Now, of course, are you right about what you're inferring? But at least they're very dense. Now you have rewards everywhere. Right? Um, so, actually, uh, sorry, just a quick question. Do you have like some, uh, you know, demonstrations there with which you do this inverse model? So, do you like to use, you know, uh, gameplay data, past experiences, and then infer what's in there? Uh, so yeah. You have some, you need some expert demonstrations for the like I have like that. Right, yeah, we're treating the, just the observed play data as X. Okay. So it's like the, the, the players are the experts, okay. which, okay, you can argue about. They are professionals. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's max entropy. It's, uh, yeah, okay, I can go over more detail. It's fairly standard. I think there's one of the things that's a bit different from standard uh, IRL um, is that we also add, the observed goals. So we sort of regularize the inferred, inferred rewards so that, you know, you do care about getting an actual goal and that helped a lot. Is that right, Gudong? Did I forget anything? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So what is the final objective of this? Like, you know, like uh, once we, uh, once you infer like the team's objective, I guess the team's objective is pretty clear, right? I mean, the team is trying to win the game by, uh, by shooting the goal. So is that like, is that the same thing that I also to use you? Uh, or is like, are you, are you trying to get a different yeah, because there's different ways to get to goals, right? Okay. So we're trying to model, uh, like, out, out of all the possible sort of paths, yeah. which paths are they pursuing? Right? Uh, okay. Okay. Can you just come up to uh, Okay, a few things that we're working on. Uh, so uh, we're pursuing um, modeling a distribution over success, not just the expected value. And the idea is that that would allow us to talk about the risk, right? Some passes are riskier than others, for example, and uh, different players uh, being more risk averse than others. Um, there's actually interesting discussion in sports analytics where some people maintain that coaches and athletes are very sensitive to the variance and tend to maybe want to minimize the variance of their actions uh, too much relative to maximizing expectation. Famous example in hockey is pulling the goalie, um, where the coaches have switched to being much more risk taking, um, or in basketball, taking three point shots. And okay, so. Um, I shouldn't go. Uh, let's follow up. I don't. I'm over time, so I don't want to go over more over the time. Uh, evaluating uh, higher levels than players, I think, would be really interesting. In hockey, it's natural to talk about evaluating lines and how well lines are doing. General sports, team sports, you often have the concept of a formation. Uh, some Swedish um, researchers that work on at least pairs of players, so we're building on our RL models. So that's you know moving in the direction of just looking at single players. Um, and uh, one of the things I started thinking about is determining the optimal action, you know, questions like, should the player have carried the puck or dumped it in? And that goes into an area called offline RL. Um, so, uh, okay, and anyway, that's, all right. So let me summarize. Uh, so I think X value learning is a fundamental task. Right? That's kind of, in my opinion, the basic statistical task we have in sports analytics. If we can do it, then we can uh, get action values and we can rank players uh, according to their performance. And reinforcement learning is a great match with this problem, right? Because they have really focused on X value learning and we can adapt a lot of uh, what they have developed. Uh, and I think, as you've seen, uh, you know, they have like really non trivial, non obvious ideas that we can draw on. Um, I think uh, more and more it's important to deal with continuous locations, continuous space time. Uh, and that's where uh, neural nets have a strength. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, current frontier, uh, I think about a lot of this idea of precision and tailoring the models towards individual teams and players. So. Okay, thanks very much for all the patience. And, um, Up the link here to our seminar. Oh, they are collaborators. Uh, thank you, Galen. Oh, Yudong, you didn't send me your photo, but you're right here, so people can see you. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to go to this thing. Maybe while we're thinking about questions. Uh, so I guess uh, people can ask questions if anybody needs to go as well. Feel free to go, but I do want to advertise that Oliver is with us for the rest of the day. Uh, so he'll be free after four o'clock. So if some of you would like to meet with him, send me an email and then I'll, I'll arrange for you to uh, make sure you can have a one on one with him. And then uh, for whoever is online, if you would like to also ask a question, just uh, raise your hand online or type a question in the chat and I, I will read it to all of you. I think I, at the 2 p.m. mark, I lost a lot of the online audience, which is uh, understandable. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, if, uh, especially for the software, like, as the dominant in the software, right? Like, uh, it was like the threat was greater in the in the area that was closest to the goal. Uh -huh. Is this the expected threat only for a shot, or do you also model for other actors, so for example, cross, like, because in say if the look ahead is just two, and if you are in the sidelines towards that, so very high crossing zone. So if you're in those areas. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So it's not my model exactly, um, but uh, okay. I, I know at a minimum. I'll show you in a minute. They consider uh, shooting and moving. So if I gave the impression that it's only shots, that, that's definitely not right. I should take that back. Uh, in fact, if we go to the other visualization here, I mean, it's kind of a nice. Uh, so here they're modeling uh, what in RL we would call the player policy. So they're saying, okay, if you've got the ball here, what are you going to do next? And you can see the choices are either moving or shooting, right? And it's kind of nice. So here they say, if a player has the ball here, they're not going to shoot because right, they're far from the goal, they're going to move. And then if you're here, then they're like, okay, they might move uh, or they might shoot. So I think that at, at the very least they have moving and this is part of what you're saying, right? They could be moving now uh, or they could be shooting. Uh, I don't know if in this model, if he has something like passing or crossing, hopefully he does. Right? So in our model, for sure, you can do any of the 13 actions I mentioned at any time, right? So now, of course, when you're close to the goal, like, for example, it's unlikely to be a hit, right? Uh, but um, that would just, uh, depending on your, if you're doing the discrete case, then we just would say the transition probability. So the probability of being close to the goal and then transitioning to uh, hit state is going to be very low. Yeah. I have a second question that was more related to the Do you ever consider like how the, so if we take an action and that leads to a goal, right now, how much of that is attributed to the operating teams actions as well? Like, because that's an aspect of the Like, you say that you are actually very good, but for example, it's not that I only understand that. But like, say the players are not maintaining the offline angle and yeah. it is more due to their point than to the better of the player yeah. in some other case or not. And there can be multiple cases of such noise for yep. uh, so how often is the opponent team space considered in attributing giving the player to yeah 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 that's a very good question. Um so for us uh well maybe let me answer but I can go uh, so basically our event data doesn't quite allow you to do that. So, at, at, so we, we basically, we just know where, yeah, maybe I'll go back. Do I still have the NHL up here? Um, hmm. Oh yeah, here it is. See here, like for example, when the hit happens, okay. So we know, okay, that was a hit. We know there are these two players, but we have no idea where anyone else is right? Uh, let alone where the opposing players were when this happened, right? Um, to some extent, if you have a temporal model, like a recurrent neural network, it can sort of infer, right? Because it can say, okay, Brandon said here he made a hit, so probably a minute later he's still in that vicinity, and but we don't really know. So you need uh, tracking data, right? I mentioned earlier, or and then for tracking data, there is a nice uh, soccer paper, uh, I can probably find it, Dick, called um, uh, Positioning, where, um, yeah, learning to rate player positioning. And I'd have to check, but it's definitely for uh, their own team. Oh, sorry, the Zoom is here. 
so I, I think it's actually there for both teams. So you know where everyone is, that's the input, right? Like I was showing you in the soccer demo. And then you're basically saying, given where everyone is right now, uh, what is the chance of scoring, right? And then you can do exactly all this. So um, this paper, I mean, it's definitely like open things, it leaves open, but it's a good example for that area. Um, yeah, okay, I can say more about it. But uh, so they had tracking data for supper somehow. But yeah, if we had tracking data, and you know, one day we will, maybe we do now. So uh, that's uh, okay, Tim can speak to this. Uh, then we could try to answer these questions. So there is a question in the chat. Oh, uh, yeah. Matt says, can you please comment on the PBOP or region both agents are? With each player as an agent instead of the two teams as agent. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I was trying to see if they give a nice. Ah, okay. Sorry, just to tie that off. Here you can sort of see what they use as input. And here you can see their computing values with associated with. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, kind of on my to do list. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about there are nice models. Um, of dynamic. Okay, so if you say, given a, a set of players, where are they going to move next, like collectively, and they use um, graph neural networks combined with recurrent neural networks. So the graph neural network is uh, modeling the interactions among the players, and then the, um, the recurrent neural network is modeling the dynamics. It's really interesting. Um, so it's, uh, I can find it, but it's like there's a yay and Kevin Murphy is the senior author from Google. Um, it's called something like modeling player dynamics in sports. Uh, there's a CDPR paper and I think they have two. Um, and, but so that's about the dynamics that's asking what will happen next. But I think you could take that and then say, okay, let's learn, instead of predicting what will happen next, let's predict, you know, who will score next. So that would be, yeah, kind of, maybe a low hanging fruit would be really interesting. So I think it's a really, that's another thing. I don't know what I would like to do next, but that's would be high on the list. So if anyone wants to maybe, if they want to look into it. Uh, yeah. And definitely if you're interested in sports plus graph representation learning, I think that's, that's a really growing uh, area for, right? This question of modeling player interactions with graph representation learning is really becoming a common technique and seems very powerful. Um, yeah, so I see you need the data though, right? That's the problem. Uh, well, would you actually, so tracking data would help a lot. So in, in these videos, they have that, right? So they know where everyone is. If you had event data, well, that would make it harder, right? But maybe you could still do it. Yeah, that's, or maybe that was the question that's actually. So I think some, like Tim mentioned the JSONs, uh, I'd have to check, but I believe if you go to the JSON on NHL.com, you can actually get who's on the ice, not just who's doing the action. And then I guess it becomes a question of um, set modeling, you know, like deep sets, right? Your input is a set. Yeah, maybe we could do that too. Okay, I hope that helps. Yeah, so I think it shouldn't, shouldn't be that hard. So. So I like the next goal, maybe to go into that detail a bit more. So like Luke Bourne, he always does scoring within a possession, also the Leuven people. Um, but like, let's say if you don't score, right? If you do score, okay, that's fine. If you don't score, that's the question. And there's different ways to fail to score. Like for example, you may, uh, like basically if you turn over the puck, right? If there's a takeaway, then the other team has a fairly high chance, right? of uh, scoring on the counter. 
Whereas like say in soccer, you might just play the ball out. So by saying, we just look ahead to the next goal, regardless of whether it's in the same possession, we can capture this notion of, okay, are you attacking in a way that, you know, you're likely to run a risk, say, of a counter? So, I kind of like it. Yeah. Obviously, when they score, it jumps to the one goal. I'm assuming that's because the goal itself is an event. Yep. And you have a goal that actually represents a chance to gain a goal. Yeah. Uh, is that included in the in the player events and value add for each player in the event? Uh, uh, shot with the 0.65 ish percent chance and look at it on the random goal. Yeah. Did you credit the added probability scoring to the player who got shot as he jumps to one? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, that is a good detail we discussed and we have different uh uh yeah but i think so and if you think about it um that's kind of like a x goal metric right so if the model says okay you're taking a shot your chance is 0.6 uh maybe it's a hard shot right and then you actually score right then you get the impact from actually yeah, scoring yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you could do it in different ways. The main concern is um, with including goals is that uh, like generally the action values are fairly, the impact values are fairly small as you see, so they can really distort. So, so I think it's right to give credit, but you have to worry about, uh, about them dominating. Sort of try, to, try to see the value of the action itself. Uh, with that and, and to eliminate the variance of the actual goals that happen over 12 seconds. So it's just an interesting variation. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's for goalies. Okay. So I would just say for goalies, that's also something people discuss a lot. Uh, like a save is not the same as a save. And then they have like normalized save percentages. Okay. Yeah. A couple more questions. Uh, so the, the X value. Yeah. I don't know if it was, it was just whatever slide you had where you showed. The difference between like R1 and P learning. Mm. Um, so you're going to ask the question about that. Maybe around here. But um, yeah, so that, that X value, the estimated next goal chance, that's the X value from a different model, correct? No, the same model. Well, I mean, there's different arguments, but generally it's the same model. So yeah. does the model learn that value? Or I thought that expected chance of the next goal came from this one. Oh, okay. Uh, no, no, it's the same model. I mean, the, the setup is like, if you think of a neural network, we're trying to train the parameters, right? So we have a current parameter setting and that is producing, let's say these three numbers, right? And now we're asking, right? Uh, should these numbers be different, right? And if so, what should they be? Okay. And then we're telling, we're going to tell the system, oh, actually, you know, this should have been uh, like whatever the difference here. And then we're going to update the parameters so that they move towards each other. Yeah. So how I'm just asking how you get the 55, 60, 75, because that yeah. was the model outputs. And yeah. then you're just trying to make it closer to the next one. Yeah, that's the, the 55, 60 to 75. That's the current output of the model. And we're going to use that to adjust the parameters of the model, and then we will get new outputs. Okay. And then we just continue to. to yeah. Yep. Then we get new outputs and we go over it again and uh, adjust the parameters again. And eventually we notice that the parameters don't change very much, and then yeah, we stop. So. They'll, so. They'll eventually converge to some. Yes. Right. For the, for the numbers. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, that's the, and then as I mentioned in RL now, and it's, that's the same for this final target learning. And then now then there's a whole lot of theory around which of these two methods will converge faster, for example. And one of the advantages of this approach is you, it generally converges faster um, because if you see here, you're always shooting at the same target. So there's less information flowing between the different estimates. So. Yeah, it can be more technical about that. Too. Yeah, okay. There's also questions in the chat, I guess. Yeah. The only thing we use at the reward function is the number of goals. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, yeah, yeah I, like I mentioned, there's different options, but uh, with me, it's even more. It's uh, zero one, right? So, do you score the next goal? Um, so, uh, this is even too much. Sparse. It is sparse, yes. So that's a big issue from a statistical learning point of view. That's one of. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why this whole thing is very hard, actually, <laughs> as, a, as a learning problem. So we have to work hard to get the convergence, right? And to, um, like, I have, we have some, like, fairly clever initializations to get good initial weights in the neural network. Uh, it has to train many times, of, like, you know, maybe a million times, go through all the data. Um, and so that's that was another, I mentioned the inverse RL. So that was another motivation for us. Um, but yeah, if you if you take it like this, and in soccer, we built a model like this for soccer. Like I said, that's even harder. So we had uh, yeah, we had all kinds of tricks there too. So it's it's not I, so I know I didn't go into the details of all the neural net training, but that's not because it's particularly easy. Um, but I, you know, I've also had people follow up and use some of our code, and I, I think you can get it to work. You know, it's, uh, it seems to it's pretty possible. Uh, yeah, maybe in the back, and then Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't do that, one might consider. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll say, sort of to do a riff on that, but just to answer what we do, no, we just have, our model says, okay, here, the impact of this action was whatever, 0.2, and that's just based completely on the current match context, so it doesn't matter what, what actually happened. Um, I think there's an interesting question, actually, that uh, Pascal and I uh, have been discussing in our group, uh, sometimes called the credit assignment problem, um, you know, if you like want to ask, okay, uh, the penguins won, like, like for example, which event was mainly responsible for that or which uh, player was mainly responsible for that? Um, or if you have a sequence, yeah, anyway, um, and so there's work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, again, our, you know, I always say RL has the resources. So in RL, they call this um, temporally delayed reward. And then um, like uh, basically assigning sort of credit uh, for that. Uh, there's a system called Rudder that we looked at. So, um, so in basically many RL problems are sparse like this one. And then you always have this problem, right? If actual rewards happen, you know, 10, only 10% 10 of the time, then you always have this problem of, okay, I actually, uh, you know, scored a point or found the key in a video game or whatever, but like 20 things happened before that. So which of these 20 things actually helped and helped the most? So, so actually a deep question, but let's work on it. Um, but yeah, we just say, okay, the model thinks this was a great thing to do, so we give you credit. Yeah. This, this is just like a super comment, but yeah. rudder really only works for single agent cases, right? But technically, the way you're modeling it, it's two agents and a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. wouldn't that impact rudders? Like, yeah. if Tampa plays, I don't know, New Jersey, or yeah. Montreal, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's different than Tampa. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that's good. Yeah, I think that could be a nice uh, thesis topic is extending this to multi, extending this idea of uh, right rudder and these temporally delayed rewards to multi agent. Because, uh, you know, a big thing, like, why are these problems hard? Well, you get these, um, you get interference problems. So, um, like if I do something and then um, someone else interferes with it, how much credit do they get compared to me? Uh, and also maybe something would have happened anyway, regardless of what I do. And so this interaction is important. Yeah. Um, 
And another thing about sports is I, uh, you know, when I say everything should be relative to context, yes, everything should always be relative to your opponent, right? Because some opponents, it's just easier to score on them, right? So you need to adjust for that. You know, some maybe uh, some opponents, uh, like in soccer, you see this very clearly, they're very good at defending and just getting close to the goal is already an achievement, right? So if you use a generic model, you might say, yeah, my team didn't do well because, you know, we only got close to the goal, I don't know, 10% of the time, but it might have been against that opponent that that was actually really good. So yeah, we always, yeah. Yeah. I'm really interested in this game impact metric. Have yeah. Maybe around slide okay. 38, you had, you were looking at correlations with other metrics. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, this one. So, so one thing I noticed is it looks like the highest correlation is with time on ice. Yeah, right. And so is it possible that you're actually measuring time on ice? So, so the more you're on the ice, the more chances you have to impact the game. Yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, have you thought about, oh, is, is that possibly what this gathering you're measuring? Or could you somehow normalize with respect to time on ice? Yeah, I was uh, somewhat obsessed with that question for about a year. <laughs> so, yeah, so an obvious worry is we add up, uh, for, we add up all the actions, right? right. So, so the first worry is, okay, so if I have a guy who takes 100 actions and I have another guy who takes 10 actions and you're adding, so you're adding 100 numbers versus the 10 numbers, you know, uh, that's... Now, one thing is uh, action impact can also be negative. Right, so that it's not just uh, uh, directly related, right? Yeah. So, uh, so that that helps. <laughs> so that is reassuring. Uh, also, like for example, the discrete uh, Markov decision process model with dynamic programming has even higher correlation, right? So the fact that like they're not all zero point nine, right? Well, that's I, yeah. I misread that. I, I, I was thinking it was point nine five five between GIM and and, uh, and uh, timeline. Yeah, so the uh, the GIM, you know, so at least it's doing something different. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the thing I was obsessed with is, and people in sports analytics will say this to me, including people at Sport Logique, is you should normalize, you should normalize, you should normalize. I say, okay, well, how? And then yeah. I say, do I divide by the number of actions? Do I divide by the number of periods? Uh, uh, Luke Bourne tends to normalize, I think, by 60 minutes um, played. Um, yeah, time on ice, uh, number of games played. And so first of all, it's not clear uh, how to do it. And the other problem, the bigger problem that I had is every time I would do that, these correlations would get poor. Mm -hmm. And I sort of couldn't figure out why. And I think the reason is that, um, the, as you're pointing out, time on ice is itself a measure of strengths because like the really strong players get played more. And so like, if you're taking one good measure of strengths and you divide it by another good measure of strengths, right? Like if they're like, let's say if they're for an extreme case, if they're just one, one is a multiple of the other, you're gonna destroy your signal, right? So yeah, so I've tried really hard to do theory on what is a good normalization. And in the end, I could never get better. And then along the same lines, if, yeah. when you're trying to rank players, one thought I had is since everything's based on the next expected goal, if you're on a team that's scoring more goals, mm -hmm. then as a player, you might have more, more points as a result. So I was trying to think about, you know, is there, again, it's, it's normalization thoughts, is, mm -hmm. is there a way to normalize for, oh, well, I'm a player on a high scoring team, so we're going to score the next goal way more than some other team. Yes, but that's what, well, okay, so that's, so if you remember the Jason Spezza example, yeah, it actually, it didn't really happen, right? And one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons to do impact. So you say, how much is what I'm doing now increasing the chance? Okay, so if I'm, if I'm on a team that always scores, like extreme example, right? 100%, we always score. Well, then I'm actually going to get zero credit in this model. Right, because I'm never increasing my team's chances. Like I'm, I'm guessing just by being on the ice, you'll get some kind of credit. Um, but but maybe yeah. I'm, maybe I'm not understanding the term. Yeah, like if I touch the puck. Yeah, but if your team was going to score anyway, right? So it's the 
it's the difference. Oh, right. It's the difference between your team's chances of scoring before and after the action, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, yeah, that's why that's I like this, you know, it's, uh, I think it's the right thing, right? You got to have as a baseline, what's that chance of scoring, right? And then how are you affecting that? So, huh? Ah. Cool. So, I don't know, chat maybe, or? Oh, okay, they're just saying thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just Yes and no. So I think, so it's not like us, really the individual, you do get things. So people try all kinds of features, let's put it that way, right? So especially if you're in a classifier setting. So you, you will definitely see things like if I know the position of the player who's acting, like, you know, offensive midfielder, defenseman, maybe left, I haven't seen that. Um, but uh, that would be possible to try. Um, I don't know. I was talking to the Leuven guys and they were saying they show, saw a model of expected goals. So just shot and is the shot going to go in? And they said, yeah, someone was doing a Bayesian model of like which players are more likely to achieve a goal, right? Like which are better shooters, but it's only for expected goals. So I, I feel like, yeah, we were sort of really at the cutting edge, maybe beyond <laughs> with uh, trying to really model every player. Um, yeah, I, I think clustering would also be, well, I mean, the embedding is kind of similar, right? Yes. Um, but I haven't even seen that, so yeah. It's really more like, okay, we learn the action values generically, right? And then we rank individual players and, and that's kind of our analysis of how individuals differ. So. Um, from a betting perspective. So I have another hat where I run a lab that produces win probabilities. And um, in that world, people, we do, and people in general really do elaborate player models. So you have like the model that we're running. Uh, if you tell me, okay, this player is on, this player is off, it will change the probabilities. So we actually wait for like five minutes before the game to, to find out what the roster is from the NHL. And then we produce our final predictions. So the whole thing has to work in real time. It's kind of stressful. I haven't had that before. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so this, I think it's more on the maybe betting world and us. So yeah, so please read our NURPS paper. It's a, it's a good paper. I'm really proud of it. So. Okay, so that's that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the questions. Great questions. Yeah.